the way you describe the NIH as this sort of um, wonderful place to be, was that during your first tour there or during the second or both? Well, so I, uh, as I came as a clinical associate, that was our title, that era was really special. Uh, then uh, I finished that in 1964, and then I went to Ben Asaraf's lab at New York University for four years, and we came back in 68. Uh, when we returned, of course, my position was very different. In 62 to 64, I was, you know, a young person. I didn't have any standing there other than being a clinical associate, but I would get to know all of the other people of my same era. Everyone was excited. When I came back, I was now a principal investigator. Uh, now it was time that I had to really do some stuff that really mattered. Um, we had, I must say, on our floor in immunology quite a remarkable collection of people. And it was early, as so we say, it, 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 in terms of modern immunology, we were early days. There were just an enormous number of things to do, and uh, everything you did could turn to gold. And uh, that was not only true of my own group, but many others. So uh, it was very exciting, that's true, as I think back now. Both in the, the you know, in the early days, um, it, you know, it's even unfair to say that, because uh, I like to say, when I started in immunology, um, I th thought we were in the midst of a revolution. And my understanding of scientific progress is that it goes in fits and starts. You have eras of great accomplishment, new ideas, new paradigms, and then you have long periods of consolidation where you build on these foundations and then you spring off to another era of revolutionary change. That's my, that's my uh, you know, academic understanding. So I came into immunology seriously in 1964. It seemed to me it was a revolutionary period. I'm still waiting for the consolidation to start. <laughs> Every era seems to bring new changes. Uh, the field is continuously fascinating. In fact, uh, I have often thought that a good title for um, uh, either a, a book or a, a lecture about immunology would be endless fascination. <laughs> what was driving this? Was it personalities? Uh, was it technology? Where, what, what was behind yeah. all of this? Well, firstly, um, immunology is a very interesting field um, in contrast to, say, biochemistry. Biochemistry is a way of doing science. You, you use biochemical tools to study particular things. Immunology is a coherent body of knowledge that you bring distinct tools to. And everyone who calls themselves an immunologist, particularly in the era when I was growing up, would share certain core knowledge that we would all have to know. So it was a community of people who, I would say, both at NIH but in the greater world, who had a very uh, common world view of this science. And as you said, things were changing, both there were new technologies, there was also, there were also new ideas. Uh, so as you probably know, immunological science is a young science. Uh, as a concrete discipline, in, co in contrast to as just accidental findings, most people would date it to the latter part of the 19th century, to uh, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, and uh, most importantly of all to uh, Paul Ehrlich. Um, and it was still looking for, um, so to speak, a, um, a central idea, a central theory that guided it. And it struggled with that for a long time. And it was only in 1957 and 59 that the central theory was enunciated. That is what is called the clonal selection theory of immunity. In 1957, um, two papers appeared, uh, one that's given all the credit by McFarlane and Burnett, but actually an earlier one, which was really first by David Talmadge. Uh, Talmadge was then a young assistant professor at the University of Chicago. 
uh, went on to spend his career in Denver at the University of Colorado, is still alive. I don't know if David was a president of this organization. He may well have been. If he wasn't, uh, was a if he was, you should interview him. <laughs> He's a wonderful man. So Talmadge and Burnett enunciated the clonal theory in 57. And then in 59, Burnett published a really magnum opus, which described the consequence of theory uh, in detail and beautifully written, and in many respects earned him the, the great uh, status he has in the field. Because the, the two initial papers were rather sketchy, but this book was wonderful. So it was really only until 57 to 59 that we had a grounding of a theoretical construct to underlay immunology. And so I'm coming into the field in the early 60s, only a few years after people were accepting this shared vision of what immunology was about. Uh, there were still people who didn't accept it, but by 64, most people did. And now you could rethink what you were doing in new terms. Um, there were new technologies coming on, but, the new, but it wasn't only the technology that was driving. It was just the, the ideas, people recognizing what you could do. It is true that uh, people were understanding the structure of immunoglobulin that was being developed at this time. Porter and Edelman were doing their work. Uh, the specificity of reactions, there had been a great effort um, in the 20s and 30s by Landsteiner to understand the specificity of antibody. But in Ben Asaraf's lab and my research project, we were interested in understanding the specificity of what today we would call T cell responses. Of course, we didn't know there were T cells and B cells in that era. But it's true also that shortly thereafter, um, people understood the function of the thymus. All these things were unknown. And while the technology was important, it, even with, with some very modest technology, a lot of exciting work could be done. But it is true, as time went on, new and newer technologies kept being available, and immunologists were very fast to take them on. In fact, it can be said that um, monoclonal antibody uh, use as an analytical tool almost certainly was best developed in immunology. Cell sorting was developed by immunologists, and we were the first to use it very aggressively. Not so much the gene knockout technology, although even there, uh, immunologists were very early. Sequencing, the more sequences done on immunoglobulins than everything else combined. So we adopted the technologies early. Um, I think it's true that technologies were important, and there's no doubt that uh, without them, uh, the field would have leveled off. Uh, each, each few years brought a new technology available to allow you to move forward. I used to say, you know, you can do today experiments that we would have called science fiction five or six years ago. That's certainly true. So yes, it, it was partly that, but not that only. It was a very strong sense of excitement of what could be accomplished. And I can certainly tell you on the 11th floor of the Building 10, our NIH buildings have very poetic names. <laughs> building 10 is the largest brick building in the world, but <laughs> beside that effect, it has this very, but on the 11th floor, you know, we'd be up and down the car, you know, they'd be on, you know, every day was a new day. So yeah, it was very exciting, I have to say. That's certainly true. Now that you remind me and send me back in the years uh, to that era. But that wasn't the only era that was terrific. So I had a very good fortune, if I may go on, in my postdocs. So I came to NIH in 1968 um, with Ben Asaraf. Uh, I had been his postdoc at New York University when he asked me to join him, which I was very grateful for. We made the arrangement we made was that I would have I work on my own projects half time, and the other half time as a partner with him. You know, which, which was fine with me. And um, we had um, in that era we had fewer postdocs, so there was one one or two postdocs that worked f on the projects I did with Baruch, and then I had one who worked on the projects I did myself. 
and everything was fine. Uh, then when Baruch left, let me see if I, I don't, I'm getting this right. Oh, yes. So then uh, the first group of postdocs that came in the door after Baruch left, they had th some of them thought they were going to work for him, but he was gone, uh, were terrific. I had unbelievable postdocs. And one, um, as an example, the leading example, it was, a man, it was Charlie Janeway. Uh, Charlie was subsequently a president of the AAI, one of the most influential of immunologists, unfortunately died as a young man, not so young, but younger than I am, uh, from uh, a brain lymphoma. But he revolutionized immunology. So Charlie was a postdoc. Uh, Jack Stobo, who subsequently was the Osler Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins. Several other people, Joe Davey, who was chairman of microbiology at Wash U and people of that sort, terrific postdocs, outstanding. I said, well, this is easy, nothing to do. And so that was one era. And then about 10 years later, again, quite without any uh, planning on my part, I had a second group of postdocs of equal, uh, equal uh, magnitude. And they included uh, Mark Davis, who cloned the T cell receptor while he was in the lab. Also, uh, one of the leading figures in our field today, uh, Laurie Glimsher, who's been a president of this association, now the dean at the Cornell Medical College, and uh, Maureen Howard, who, with whom I discovered IL-4, uh, Tony DeFranco, who uh, was chairman of Micro at UCSF, and several others. I mean, quite remarkable. So I've had really good luck with postdocs, but uh, they come in bunches. <laughs> and uh, that gives you um, an optimistic view of the world, I tend to think.